Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rob. I'm the platform architect for App London. Um, so I'm here to tell you today about how we've had success with Aerospike and more specifically, how we use Aerospike and Spark together in order to unlock the next level of performance for us. Um, having joined the company during its founding, um, almost around six years ago now, um, I have been responsible for scaling the platform from our very first ad request up until the point where we're at today handling over 70 billion ad requests per day. Oh. All right, so first of all, just um, let me just say that what a typical day is like for us at App Um So from an aerospace perspective, um, as you can see, it's fairly hectic. In this graph, each one of these lines represents one of our aerospace clusters and how many operations per second it's doing throughout a given sample day. Um, and as you can see, we have a number of different deployments. Um, they don't necessarily follow the same uh, usage patterns because we have a number of different things that we've actually applied aerospace to. Um, but yeah, so we have yeah, a lot of different things running. Um, Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about our scale um, and why it matters. Uh, so first of all, at any given point in time, we have over three billion active devices that are contacting us. Um, and so what this means in terms of Aerospike is for each of these devices, we have at least one record that we need to be able to look up within the quick span of an ad request. And so we need it to be typically under a millisecond or around a millisecond for our average lookup time. And then um, since the original use case for the devices, uh, we've actually applied it to a number of other things. So at the moment, we actually have 35 different production deployments running Aerospike. Um, you might have noticed in the previous graph that you probably didn't see that many lines. It's because most of them are generally smaller scale instances, and those are kind of like our high performance ones. Um, and then just generally speaking, uh, across all these 35 instances, we have about 350 servers in our organization that are running Aerospike at any given point in time. And of these 350 uh, servers, about 200 of which are actually dedicated Aerospike instances, and what that means is that we have at least one SSD or NVMe drive that is allocated specifically for that instance. Um, and then the other 150 or so, um, we basically just co-locate Aerospike in-memory instance with the application that wants to use it. You don't get the same performance, but it's a big cost-saving measure for uh, the smaller scale deployments that you want to do. And then just generally speaking, uh, we have over 700 terabytes of disk allocated to our clusters and over 70 terabytes of RAM allocated to them. And at any given point in time, we're storing about 250 billion objects across all of our instances and all of our clusters. And these aren't just static objects either. We actually expire about 4 billion of them every single day. But for every object that we expire, at least one more is created in its place as we're constantly growing. And here you can kind of just see um, in aggregate what we do across all of our clusters on a given day. Um, at any given point in time, we're doing at least 1.4 million writes a second and at least uh, 4 million reads a second. And then our peak traffic, I think we break uh, 2 million writes per second and 6 million reads per second. So let me just talk a little bit about the various things that we've actually applied Aerospike to successfully within app Loven. Um, so first and foremost is our device data storage. This is actually the original reason why we discovered Aerospike and why we adopted it. Um, this is one of the first problems that we had to solve as an ad network because, I mean, from the get-go, we have to be able to access user data within the span of an ad request. Um, but originally, we actually chose a combination of MongoDB and Redis to do this, but that didn't last us too long um, as we started scaling up. Eventually, we swapped it out for Cassandra. Um, that also only lasted a few more months. And finally, we landed on Aerospike. And we've been pretty happy with that ever since. Um, and since we have adopted Aerospike, we've actually scaled down those instances um, as we reduced the number of servers by adding NVMe hardware and actually lowering our latencies at the same time. Um, so the next thing that we applied Aerospike to, uh, which is very similar, is our XDR data. Similarly, it's also for devices, but it's for stuff that needs to be available in real time across multiple data centers. And this can be really useful for things like fraud prevention and capping the number of ads that a user sees. 
Um, and then one of the next things that we applied it to, which was a natural fit for us, was the down funnel event tracking. Um, the reason why this is such a natural fit is because typically you're trying to join um, the origin events such as an impression with the down funnel events such as a click. And typically you want to match across tens of billions of these events and you want to do so using some sort of provided user key. So obviously Aerospike is a great decision for doing this at real time. Um, and then one of the next things that we applied it to was a little bit of a less obvious use case. Um, and this is because Aerospike traditionally was uh, not a consistent database. Um, what we wanted to do is count uh, various values across billions of different dimensions. Um, and originally we wanted to use a consistent database for this, but unfortunately all the ones that we saw on the market weren't quite able to handle the performance that we needed for the application. So ultimately we decided to just go with Aerospike anyway, and anytime a network partition happens, we just wipe out the cluster, reload it, and call it a day. But that's just kind of the cost of doing business that way. And hopefully with Aerospike 4, we'll actually be able to end that route and stop worrying about these little inconsistencies. Um, and then one of the final things is, um, is atomic state tracking. And the atomic state tracking is basically, um, so anytime we have an application, uh, where we're tracking the state of a record over a few different um, forms, typically using MySQL with the primary key in order to do this. As soon as we grow beyond the limits of MySQL, then Aerospike usually becomes the next thing that we apply it to. Um, and then finally, we have our Spark functionality enhancements, and this is what I'll be spending the rest of the discussion mostly talking about. So Spark and Aerospike. Um, so initially when we adopted Aerospike, uh, it was very early on. We were still a very early stage startup. And because of this, um, we didn't actually have a full-fledged data warehouse yet. And that meant that in the beginning, Aerospike was actually the only unified place for our device data. Uh, so it made it really difficult to actually answer certain questions. Um, and naturally, as soon as we added our data warehouse and adopted Spark and HDFS, we were immediately trying to figure out ways that we could combine these systems and use them together. So what was the problem? The original problem was that our data wasn't accessible quickly in bulk. Aerospike is great at doing really fast key value lookups, but it's not so great at iterating over all of your data and actually finding a high level answer such as how many devices have feature X, or you know, what is the distribution of feature Y? Um, so when someone from business intelligence comes to me, or one of the other engineers has a problem that they want to debug, it really had a very slow turnaround time. Namely, we would first end up writing the scan job, then we would have to debug it on dev, then we would probably wait for nighttime for peak traffic to die down, finally we'll run this thing overnight, and hopefully the next day if you have no bugs, then you actually have the answer to give back. And unfortunately, most of these questions have follow-up questions because naturally it's an investigative process and based on the answer to question A, you have question B. And this can drag on from a day to a week or more. So clearly it was just unacceptable. So what was the solution? So the solution for us, um, as soon as we adopted Spark and we adopted HDFS, uh, one of the first things that we wanted to solve was how do we actually use our device data within our Spark jobs. And so in the beginning, we just wrote a pretty basic um, flow to fix this. Uh, we just wrote a Spark job. Uh, we chose Spark to do this part because it's easy to distribute the tasks across many servers. And we wrote a Spark job to basically do the scan of the cluster and just take in uh, a host, a namespace, and a bin, and it would just export all of the values to a simple gzip file. And then within your Spark job, you can iterate over all of this and you now have access to all of this data. Additionally, after that, we started using this as our backup resource solution, which was just a natural fit because, well, luckily for us, even though it was so simple, we were actually storing the key in the value and we were storing enough information to generate the TTL. And so we're able to actually do these full cluster restores just off this simplified approach. But unfortunately, when we tried to apply it to the next problem, that's when we realized that um, whether it was because we didn't store the key or whether it was because uh, we had multiple bins, multiple different values, 
uh, it didn't really work as a general all-purpose solution. Uh, so eventually we kept iterating on this and we came up with our final form where we actually have a full feature parity of AS Backup and AS Restore, but it runs about 80% faster and it stores all of the data um, in Parquet format using the original types and with all of the original metadata. And so ultimately the results were our original scan job, basically it took about 24 hours to get an answer uh, when business teams ask you a question. Uh, and then our final form of if you can actually just use the most recent export, now you can actually generate <coughs> this data in about two minutes or 750 times faster. And then in the middle is this other case where you actually want a fresh answer. You're not okay with using the backup from last night or last week, and that's where you want to do a full export of the cluster. Uh, and that was reduced to about three hours with the speed of our new exports job. So here's just an example of the new world of business intelligence and debugging uh, once we switched over to the system. So we use Apache Zeppelin as our method of giving access to the Spark data for our developers. Um, and it provides a very nice UI. Um, we provide APIs to easily access the data. Um, and as you can see, it's just a simple one-liner at this point in order to actually uh, extract all the countries from the device records and graph it out and we can visualize it in a number of different forms. And also this actually enables just a whole new general level of debugging that didn't exist before because in the past we were looking at a live instance of the database and we're only seeing what's there right now. And unfortunately, some questions, it's nice to be able to look at the history. And so now that we have these archived backups over time, we can answer questions like if you wanna see, you know, where did all these new users come from? You could actually just subtract last month's backup from today's backup, load the new user set into memory and Spark, and then just use Zeppelin to quickly start projecting across different dimensions and hopefully it becomes obvious that, hey, all these new users were from one publisher or one application or one country and it's most likely fraudulent and now you know what to do. Can't get this to go. Oh, there we go. So how did we scale it up? So like I said, in the end, we reached a point where we were 80% faster than AS Backup. Uh, but this didn't just happen immediately. It took a few iterations to get there. Our initial version just distributed the tasks across a Spark job um, such that each task ran on a different server and exported from one of the AirSpike servers say, to HDFS. But unfortunately, we found that the bottleneck was actually writing to HDFS and not receiving the records from AeroSpike. And so we started working to decouple that and we added a queuing in between that um, separated out the reading from the writing side, but that still wasn't quite enough. And then that led us to our final form uh, in which we actually fan out over a number of different configurable writer threads. And finally, at this point, is where we were able to get almost two times faster than just running AS Backup. And here's kind of just a general comparison of how they all worked. Um, AS Backup on the left is when you're just telling it the entire cluster and it's doing all nodes at once which is the slowest. Um, then you have in parallel, you can do each node, which is obviously goes up by a factor of the number of nodes. Uh, finally, when you tried our approach, the initial one was already about halfway between the AS Backup versions. Um, our second approach was almost as fast as AS Backup, and it was only on this final one that we actually were able to beat it. Um, and then at that point, we were, I think at the end, we were able to export our entire device data set, um, since it was NVMe hardware and only about two and a half hours at this point, which was pretty good for us. So what's next? Um, so what I've said so far is how we managed to augment our Aerospike solution using Spark to get us quick access to the data and to add this compute layer that didn't exist before. But what if we could do the other way around? What if we can actually use Spark, uh, use Aerospike to speed up our Spark jobs? Um, so initially my first thought was aggregation, because um, you want to avoid these large shuffles and with aggregation, what, maybe we could just save the results in Aerospike, use generational writes, and then export the results. Unfortunately, there was an inherent problem here that the more you aggregate, the more you hit the same keys and the less happy Aerospike is. 
Aerospike is really happy hitting a lot of different keys with no collisions, not as happy doing a lot of writes to the same record. So that led to the next two ideas, which are set operations and things like one-to-one -one joins. And the reason why these work so well with Aerospike is because they're inherently uh, distinct data sets, so you can load them up pretty quickly and query against them pretty quickly without having these collisions. So what was the problem that we actually applied these to? Um, so the problem was that we had this uh, down funnel event matching application in which we're trying to tie uh, two different points uh, in the event attribution stream together, such as like a click to an impression. And we already had various of these running on Aerospike in real time, but this one in particular, uh, we had the data only in Vertica at the time, and so we thought it would just be easy just to execute it using a Vertica join. And so we didn't need the real time at first, so we were doing this join in Vertica, um, but it didn't last us very long, unfortunately, because uh, right around the time that we were actually trying to migrate this over to Aerospike, and we were probably about a month away from this, the Vertica query just completely started failing, mostly because we actually ran out of resources to do the join, and that meant that it wasn't a quick solution to get out of it. Um, and also, I should say that just the nature of this problem specifically involves very disproportionately sized data sets, usually tens of millions with tens of billions. Um, and so you don't really want to shuffle around your large data set if you can avoid it. You only really want to shuffle around the smaller data. Um, so initially our Vertica solution was nearly 400 cores. Um, it was about an hour of runtime and uh, two terabytes of RAM. And if you average that out, as I said, the data set is about 10 billion objects, we're doing effectively around 2.7 million events per second. Um, and so we started trying to see what else we could do and where else we could run this query. And immediately we thought of moving it over to Spark. And so we re-implemented it on Spark. Um, but unfortunately, we immediately found that we were using a ton of resources and we needed these resources for other applications. So we had to figure out a way to make it more efficient. And what we noticed is that both Spark and Vertica do the same sort of inefficient joins by default, where they distribute all of this data around, even though you really don't want to be shuffling these massive, massive data sets if you can avoid it. So Spark to the rescue. So our initial, support, our initial approach was to rewrite it in Spark SQL. Luckily, we already had it in a SQL query, so this was actually pretty easy. I think before the end of the current day that it failed, we actually had this version running and it was actually working. But what we saw is that the performance was a choice between using thousands of cores um, just to get the same runtime, or limiting to the original number amount of resources, but then unfortunately it would take five hours to actually run this job, which was not going to be okay either. But at least it ran successfully, so we had a temporary solution until we could figure out something better. So then we started thinking about another approach. And the second approach was using Spark Broadcast. So in a broadcast join, um, as you can see in the diagram, you basically um, take your smaller data set, distribute the entire copy to each of your nodes, and then you take your local data set and locally iterate over it, joining with the smaller data set in memory. And if you can fit within this approach, it can be extremely fast and for us, um, as we tested it, it seemed like it was going to work out great, and it got about 100x faster than our original approach. But then when we actually went to apply it in production, it completely failed because we didn't realize that there was a hard two gigabyte broadcast limit, and we were well beyond it. So there was no way that we were going to actually get that solution to work, unfortunately. So ultimately, as you probably guessed, what we're trying to do is avoid the shuffle. Um, so we came up with a creative idea of taking and installing Aerospike onto each and every one of our Spark nodes and just dedicating a small amount of RAM to the Aerospike instance and running it in memory only. Um, and then from there, we can actually take our smaller data set and load it up into Aerospike where we basically just key off whatever our join key is and then for the values, we just put each of the columns that we want to join in into a different bin within Aerospike. Um, and then we can just iterate locally and query Aerospike in order to join all of our data together. So here's just kind of how that works in general. Um, 
So basically, we take the smaller data set, uh, we pass it into Aerospike, Aerospike handles all of the actual distribution of data for us, um, and then afterwards, we take our larger data set, locally, we query Aerospike for it, and while this may seem very similar, like we're still actually shuffling the data, it's not actually really the case, and that's because Aerospike, when we were actually querying for this data, instead of it shuffling the entire large row from the original data set, all we're now sending is this tiny little hash to see if it has a match. And like I said, for us, 99.9% .9 of the data had no match, so it was actually extremely quick for our use case. So how did it work? So we made a proof of concept. Um, this initial proof of concept, uh, initially it worked, um, but I wanted to see how we could benchmark it and scale it up. I think the initial solution wasn't faster than Spark yet, but it was showing some promising results. Uh, so the next thing to do was to come up with a benchmark query that can more accurately determine the effectiveness of it. Um, and for us, the simplified benchmark query was to just load a bunch of random numbers into Aerospike and then run through the numbers one to 100 billion and check if all of them are in Aerospike. And that was a nice, long, consistent test where we could get good readings. Uh, so we ran through the proof of concept on this benchmark query, and we were able to get about 10 million reads per second on the Aerospike cluster, uh, which was OK, um, but it still wasn't quite as fast as what we were getting from just using Spark alone. Um, but this initial implementation used only standard gets and puts. And after we tried to tune Aerospike's configuration, that didn't really get us much further. We started doing a little bit of more research, and we discovered that was right around the time that Aerospike released their new batch protocol. And their new batch protocol was supposed to be a lot more efficient because, namely, it actually combined uh, the messages to a single server um, into one message. So it reduced a lot of the internet communication. So we implemented this, and it was actually 23 times faster than without the batch protocol. And we got about 230 million reads per second on our cluster, and at this point, uh, versus just Spark alone, we're actually performing seven times faster than running the exact same job as a Spark query. Um, and with the amount of servers we were running, we were actually seeing up to six million reads per second per node, which we had definitely not seen before. Um, and the final resources for our original job was actually, so we kept the same number of cores, we were actually able to reduce the RAM by a quarter, and ultimately it ran in five minutes versus the original one hour runtime. Does that include the Aerospike cluster to support it? Um, yeah, more or less. Um, yeah, it does include it. Um, yeah, we tuned down the memory on the Spark side. It really didn't need that much at that point. And then most of it was actually allocated to Aerospike. Um, and then, so for overall joint throughput, so on the left, uh, you can see the Spark shuffle. If your data sizes aren't that big or you have the resources, this is the out-of-the-box one that works really easy, and I suggest you use it. If you can fit into a Spark broadcast, then you should definitely go for it, because that is 100 times faster and definitely beats the Aerospike solution. But if you're too big for that, which a lot of us probably are, then this uh, solution in the middle can actually get you to be seven times faster than just your Spark job alone. How do you choose which data to store in Spark? Um, I mean, in our case specifically, we knew which data set was the bigger one and the smaller one. You definitely, it helps to have that information. Um, so, I mean, it's not like this is as generally applicable to just any job where you're doing this join or any set operation. Um, it's, most, it's more applicable when you do have these disproportionate data sizes and you know which one is the smaller one. But, but I guess, how do you decide which stream goes where? Which stream goes where? Um, what goes sorry. To spike? What goes to the spike and what goes to spot? Uh, so we just take, uh, well, because it's two different data sets. So we take one of the data sets, load it entirely into Aerospike, and then we take the other one and just... Like a different business side or something, right? Different business meeting or...? Uh, no, I just mean like, like one could be all of the impressions for ads that we served, and the other could just be the clicks on it, which is a small percentage in comparison. So this is just graphs of when we were actually doing the benchmark. As you can see, we actually managed to break 200 million reads per second on our cluster, which we thought was pretty cool. And we got about four to six million reads per second per node. 
And then overall, going back to the original problem, uh, Vertica, if you average it out, is effectively doing about 2.7 billion records per second. Uh, Spark Shuffle uh, was the slowest approach at only about 500,000 records per second using the same amount of resources. And then our final solution ran at about almost 4 billion records per second, uh, again, using the same amount of resources, but actually less memory. And so finally, bringing it to the masses, namely our small engineering team, uh, how am I going to have anyone else make use of what I did if they had to go through all the work that I had to do? Uh, so basically, we needed to simplify it and abstract it, make it easy to use. Uh, so we hid all of the stuff that had to do with Aerospike or the fact that it was really even using Aerospike. Um, we hid namespaces, set spins, TTLs, all of that and just wrapped it up in a nice neat little API that actually just matched Spark's original API. And since Spark is written in Scala, and Scala is so extensible, we could actually just tack our functions onto the RDD classes and data frame classes themselves. And it became as easy as importing the right thing and adding arrows to the function you wanted to replace. I have a question about the collocation on the computer spikes. And we were talking about the uh, like installing various spike to the same nodes where mm -hmm. Spark, uh, where Spark is. So uh, to prevent shuffling, you have to collocate data as well, basically distribution page data. How did you choose that? Uh, I mean, you, you can check the hash and verify that data is collocated, but then initially you have to basically collocate data based on some criteria. So when you're loading into Spark and Iris Spike, you have to choose the same. Unfortunately, if you, you just mean allocating the sizes for the namespaces and everything? Is yeah. that what you mean? Yeah, unfortunately, we just kind of picked a general um, large size that we were willing to just permanently give to Aerospike that any job could use. Um, we didn't pick it specifically to that application. We just made it large enough that all of our jobs would be able to use it and not really have an issue. Um, but yeah, that's definitely one of the limitations of this is that they don't mix entirely cleanly, and that leads to a few potential issues, which is actually my next slide. Um, so limitations of this. Um, first is the set and bin limitations. Uh, can only have 32 bins, so it can only join in 32 columns in the way that I first implemented it. Um, sets is also an issue. You'd like to have each RDD that you're loading into Aerospike be in its own set, but since there's a maximum number of sets and we're using persistent instances, that became an issue. So we started sharing the same set, which led to key conflicts. Um, and then finally, the biggest issue here, um, well, there's also what you mentioned with allocating, um, but it's the potential for cascading failures. If one job fills it up and the other job now fails because that job did something wrong, then that would obviously be pretty terrible. Um, we didn't use it for too many applications, so we didn't really run into that issue, but we knew that that could be an issue. Um, and you still need to know where to apply it. Um, you still need to know the specific use case where it's beneficial, which makes it a little bit tougher. Um, so feature improvement ideas, first and foremost, would be, um, I don't even know if this is possible, but in the newer version of Spark, they have a sort of cost-based optimizer, so we could somehow plug into that to know when to use this, when it's actually more efficient, then that would obviously be great. Um, and then just generally, uh, the best improvement that we could probably make for this would be if we could actually just launch the clusters for the job and like you said, pick the amount of resources that that job is supposed to use and then potentially just launch it on Mesos, uh, then that would be the most ideal way, cleanest way to do it. And that solves most of the other limitations as well, like uh, sets and key conflicts and all that stuff. But that's obviously a lot tougher to get out, so unless we start using this a lot more seriously and for more things, I doubt it won't we'll take it that far. So key takeaways here, um, first of all, adding a compute layer to your Aerospike data and having it be quickly accessible in a place other than Aerospike, uh, for us it led to a 750x improvement in actually answering questions on this data. Um, secondly is that backup solutions uh, to Spark or backup solutions specifically to distributed file systems where you're not limited by the IO of a single box, because uh, AS backup, you can only do it to the local file system. Uh, so that can be up to 2x faster than AS backup alone. Um, and finally, by actually combining Spark and Aerospike together, uh, you can actually achieve performance that can be up to 7x faster than just Spark alone. And that's all.
Any questions? You're, say you're throwing 750 terabytes. I assume you're not dumping 750 terabytes every day or anything. Like, are you taking incremental snap like uh, or? Yeah, so 750 terabytes is the aggregate across all of our clusters. Um, so typically, most of our exports are probably in like the, well, I think in compressed format, the final size of the export is usually around two terabytes is our typical size one. Um, yeah, and since one of the main issues is also since we're uh, going from NVMe hardware on Aerospike, and we don't usually have NVMe hardware elsewhere. When you export from Aerospike using AS backup, typically your hardware that you're going to is always slower, and so that helps a lot there. Any other questions? Is it a full backup, or are you taking a, uh, what changed is the previous backup? I uh, know we're always taking full backups. And would it help to think of what's changed? Um, potentially, um, but yeah, I mean, we just um, always do it as a full backup restore solution. Um, yeah, probably could implement it that way, but for us it's just easier to have full, complete backups. How long it takes to um, on our typical um, use case, which is the device data, it's about three billion records, um, and that's about two and a half hours to export the whole cluster. And, and there is a practical reason for that, right? So, for the backup. so in other words, if your cluster will completely go down, then within a reasonable period of time, you can restore from backup? Yeah, and we, yeah, we take regular backups to do that as well. Um, but if we want to do an actual quick backup restore, um, typically whatever the most recent archive backup is too old. So we'll actually want to grab it from the live cluster right now, and that's definitely where that speed comes in handy. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Rob, thank you. Appreciate it.